In the name of God, eternal rock, life-giving water, and rushing wind. Amen. Good morning. I have to warn you before I get started that last night I was at a gospel concert that uh, Rachel, Rachel's in a gospel group at college, and we drove over to see it, and it was performed uh, like a service in a church where gospel music would be sung. And uh, the closing prayer was longer than most Episcopal sermons. When I told the choir this, they asked me whether that was a threat or a promise. So we'll see. Hang on to your hats, fasten your seatbelts, and away we go. I'd like to take as my text today, happy are the people whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. And we'll get there, uh, but we'll get there after a little while. I went, I went biking yesterday morning, and uh, you could certainly tell riding around that it's getting to the change of seasons. Lots of the leaves were already down off the trees. And one of my least favorite seasons is coming, the part of fall that's kind of wet and drab and dark and soggy and pretty colorless. I love the fall, the early fall, particularly in the Northeast. It's bright, it's crisp. There's a riot of color on all the trees. And I love the winter. The snow covers everything. It even makes that pile of leaves that I didn't rake look beautiful in the backyard. I, I mean, what's not to love about a Rochester winter? I mean, it's cold, but you can wear that like a badge of honor. See where the tips of my fingers are, have fallen off? That's where I shoveled till I dropped during the blizzard of 92. It's great. So I love fall. I love winter. But I don't like the in-between time very much. Our lives are a lot like that. We have ups and we have downs. We travel from one place to another, sometimes with some pretty grim stretches in between. We travel for a long time across varying scenery, some of the scenery familiar, some strange, and we find ourselves right back where we were before but somehow different. And it's not just what happens to us. It's how we feel about ourselves. Experiences can be good or bad, but our self-concept can be good or bad as well. We can be on the top of the world at one minute, down in the dumps the next, even when we're repeating exactly the same experience. Today's gospel tells the stories of two men, each doing the same thing, but in very different internal circumstances. Their circumstances are different in their lives, and their circumstances are different in their understanding of themselves. One of the men is a Pharisee. He's a member of a religious group that paid particular attention to the rules for being righteous. Although we think of him as rich, he needn't necessarily have been rich. What he was was observant, righteous, and right. Things are going well in his world. He's doing what he should. He thinks, I pray, I fast, I tithe. And what's more, he knows deep down that he's right. Thank you, God. At least I'm not like this tax collector over here. The other man is a tax collector. He's sold out to the Romans. He's a pawn of the occupying power. Although we usually think of him as being humble in his circumstances, he needn't necessarily have been so. 
collecting people's taxes and siphoning off a little bit for oneself was a pretty good way to get rich in first century Judea. What he felt, however, was miserable. I feel about myself the way everyone else feels about me. I am a worm and no man. Jesus tells us that the prayer of the humble man rose higher than the prayer of the self-satisfied one. The rest of our readings today tell us much, much more about what we should think about that and about what we should see in that for ourselves. Paul's letter to Timothy today covers all sorts of conditions of life in just four short verses. At the start of the piece that we read, Paul is nearing the time of his execution. He is being poured out as a libation, like sacred wine being tipped out of a cup onto the ground as a sacrifice to a pagan god. It's pretty grim stuff. By the end of the reading, however, Paul's faith in God's mercy reasserts itself. He remembers God's saving him in the past and asserts, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. Perhaps not from death, but God will save him for God's heavenly kingdom. We've seen Paul cross all points of the cycle of despair and hope in his assessment of his physical state. But this reading shows us more. It also shows us many sides of Paul's personality. He begins by justifying himself. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. But then he really gets warmed up. The crown of righteousness is reserved for me. And he moves on to make sure that other people know where they stand. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but may it not be counted against them. He out-Pharisees the Pharisee in Jesus' tale. What are we to take from this? Paul was a human being. The Pharisee and the tax collector in the parable are human beings. Human beings have good and bad, pride and prejudice, joy and despair, humility and arrogance, all wrapped up within them. We have good and bad, pride and prejudice, joy and despair, humility and arrogance, all wrapped up within us. We are the tax collector. We are the Pharisee. We are that complex mixture of greatness and flaws that was Paul. Ben Sira, writing in our first reading, in a book that many of us remember as Ecclesiasticus, which sits in that middle part of the Bible that's missing in some of them, called the Apocrypha, reminds us of the God's eye view of this human situation, of us being this group of things mingled up within ourselves. In the God's eye view, he reminds us of some of the usual things that we say about God. God will ignore the widow, God will not ignore, I'm sorry, the widow and the orphan. But he also reminds us of another, us of another aspect of God's mercy in a very strange phrase. God will not show partiality to the poor. Let me repeat that. God will not show partiality to the poor. 
How do we translate that? That doesn't sound like what we usually think of. Well, God will be fair to everyone. God will be merciful to everyone, regardless of how deserving we make ourselves of God's mercy. God will be his mercy to the Pharisee as to the tax collector. Even when we are so puffed up, so self-reliant, so self-righteous, so willing to judge others, when our prayers are so weighted with self-importance that they can barely lift off the ground, God reaches down to lift them up. God reaches down to lift us up. When we are so low emotionally that we feel we're beyond hope or help, and we're, or when we're so high emotionally that we feel we're beyond needing help, God is there for us. Okay, so good, bad. God's there for us. Haughty, in despair, God's there for us. So are we off the hook? God reaches down to us, holds us up when we need it most, when we feel we deserve it least, and when we feel we need it least. We've got to respond. We have got to respond. And we can do that by remembering in the words of the psalm today that we are on the pilgrim's way on our way to Zion. Our life is not an endless series of circles coming back to the same barren place where the light is waning and the leaves are fallen. From a God's eye view, our lives have a third dimension. They are spirals, ultimately leading to God, however we wander, however we err, however often we look away, however often we cannot see. We need to walk on our journey like we know that. We need to walk like we mean it. Walk whenever we can with some spring in our step. Make more of our steps towards a better world. Make more of our steps ones to lift up a struggling brother or sister, whether that's here in this sanctuary, there in coffee hour, out on the street, in school nine with a little kid, uh, for a family that's hungry at the raft, food shelter, whether that, or whether that's for someone who we don't know, we'll never know, somewhere far away, in a place that we hope we never have to go. We need to sing a little on our way. We need to bring along others with us out of their darkest doubt. We need to keep our eyes on the prize even in the lowest valleys. Whether we're in the valley from disease or from despair or from that, or whether we're in that most dangerous of places, success. We need to walk like pilgrims with purpose on the path and glory in the goal. When we remember in every step that we take, in everything we say and everything we do, that we are on a journey to God, we, like the pilgrims in the psalm, will be able to climb from height to height. We'll have to throw our prayers a little less far, and God will have to stoop a little bit less to welcome us home. Amen.